Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Olivia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. You know, it's weird, but I feel like almost like like deja, deja vu kind of thing, like we've done this before. Um, yeah. Uh, so the reason that you're not getting this episode on launch day, but like probably the night of launch day or the, or the morning after is because me and Livius already recorded this and um, through just bad luck... Um, lost part of the recording so we have to redo the entire uh entire review yeah let's be fair by part of the recording he means my part my part of the recording (laughs) like i thought well if rob just sends me the file maybe i can just fill in the empty spots so um yeah we had a we had a mishap and um we're doing this again so it's important that we mention that not just to show how how dedicated we are to the process um but, you know, I, I was thinking about this earlier. It might be a little weird because once we get talking about it, I, I don't know that my brain will be able to differentiate today between today and like yeah. two days ago. So if, if you hear anything that doesn't make sense, like maybe you missed something, you probably didn't miss anything. It's probably me not realizing that, you know, we didn't tread the exact same waters um, as we did the first time. Yeah. Um, just before we started recording to Livius uh, made the point uh to me because i felt terrible that um we have to do this again that uh, in, in the entire history of the podcast you know over nine years uh, over 500 episodes this is like the third time we've had to re-record an episode because of technical difficulties so <clears throat> yeah our, our success rate is very good but there's it's like there's nothing i mean as a writer if you lose a chapter and you have to rewrite it it's never the same you know it's not the same word so I'm worried. I was worried that our conversation is going to seem inauthentic, but um, maybe we'll just do it better. <laughs> Who knows? So. You never know. We should tell people. I mean, I'm sure that they already saw the name of the episode. But I guess we didn't mention what we're reviewing again. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we are uh, reviewing the book Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay. And I'm just going to knock out uh, author bio really quick so we can jump into this conversation. Uh, he is the author of the Bram Stoker Award and Locus Award winning Cabin at the End of the World winner of the British Fantasy Award for Disappearance at Devil's Rock, Bram Stoker Award slash Massachusetts Book Award winner for A Head Full of Ghosts. A Head Full of Ghosts is in development with focus features. He's also the author of the novels The Little Sleep, No Sleep Till Wonderland, Swallowing a Donkey's Eye, and Floating Boy and the Girl Who Couldn't Fly, which is co-written with Stephen Graham Jones. His newest book is his newest book before the book that we're about to talk about is Growing Things and Other Stories. His newest, newest book, Survivor Song. His essays and short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Time and numerous years' best anthologies. He's the co-editor of four anthologies, including Creatures, 30 Years of Monster Stories, edited with John Langan. Paul is on the board of directors for the Shirley Jackson Award, lives outside of Boston, Massachusetts, has a master's degree in mathematics, and has no uvula. I think um, it would be cooler if he had two, like, he was like, he has two uvulas, yeah. like... I was going to say, insert <laughs> insert previous uvula joke here, or I feel like we maybe covered this yeah. recently. Um, <laughs> all right, here is the synopsis. In a matter of weeks, Massachusetts has been overrun by an insidious rabies-like virus that is spread by saliva. But unlike rabies, the disease has a terrifyingly short incubation period of an hour or less. Those infected quickly lose their minds and are driven to bite and infect as many others as they can before they inevitably succumb. Hospitals are inundated with the sick and dying, and hysteria has taken hold. To try and limit its spread, the Commonwealth is under quarantine and curfew, but society is breaking down and the government's emergency protocols are faltering. Dr. Ramola Rams Sherman, a soft-spoken pediatrician in her mid-30s, receives a frantic phone call from Natalie, a friend who is eight months pregnant. Natalie's husband has been killed, viciously attacked by an infected neighbor, and in a failed attempt to save him, Natalie, too, was bitten. Natalie's only chance of survival is to get to a hospital as quickly as possible to receive a rabies vaccine. The clock is ticking for her and for her unborn child. Natalie's fight for life becomes a desperate odyssey as she and Rams make their way through a hostile landscape filled with dangers beyond their worst nightmares. Terrifying, strange, and sometimes deadly challenges that push them to the brink. Paul Tremblay once again demonstrates his mastery in this chilling and all-too-plausible novel that will leave readers racing through the pages and shake them to their core. Did you, uh, did it shake you to your core? 
I was, uh, I was, I don't know. Like, I don't look, I'm, I'm old and I'm out of shape. I don't even know if I have a core. <laughs> you got to do some core exercises. I need to do some, I need to strengthen my core so I can know where my core is. So I can be shaken to it from time to time. That's, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say off the bat, the synopsis is really good. I feel like it's a very good representation of what, uh, what goes on in the book. Um, and yeah, I probably have a little, a lot of cushion around my core, but I, so I knew I was shaken for sure. Just a matter of how much, um, so far as the synopsis goes, one of the things I want to point out is the synopsis is, uh, very accurate in stating, um, that this is a, a brief glimpse inside of a much bigger occurrence. So the occurrence is this pandemic with the, these uh, accelerated rabies-like symptoms that cause people to become violent and infect one another and so forth. But it's interesting because uh, I, I didn't, you know, like I had actually read the synopsis at, at some point, and I guess it didn't hit me that this is a time frame short book, that this this book does not cover a long period of time. That's, yeah. Um, and I know you love those types of stories, those... Uh... And it's it's weird because it's not like it's a slice of life type of thing, but like it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't take it doesn't take place over a large span of time. Um, and I guess I guess we have to do the acknowledgement of the fact that we're going to be talking about a pandemic book during a pandemic, and really, um, it's interesting to see the parallels uh, of what's happening um, socially. And um, I guess governmentally between what, you know, we see in the book and what was ha happening in real life right now. And we have to acknowledge the fact that the book was written and completed well before um, COVID-19 happened. So the release time is coincidental, um, but it's interesting because uh, in our original conversation that we had uh, in the in the Lost episode, in the Lost review, uh, it's Livius made an excellent point. Uh, which is that we're never going to know what this book would be like if we, you know, to read it having not been going through a pandemic. I think I said that weird, but I think you get the point. Um, yeah, the how do I say this? So at the beginning, we're we're dropped in mid, um, you know, weird rabies pandemic, right? So, so it's already happening. Um, we get caught up pretty quickly through through the eyes of Natalie, who's um, sitting at home waiting for her husband to go to come back from a um, kind of like a, it seems like a government regulated food run um, for for himself and and for her. So that's where we start to get glimpses. And then when we're introduced to Dr. Ramola, who I will refer to as Rams because Ramola just doesn't roll off the tongue um, the way I'd like it to. Um, that, what Rob was saying about the similarities is really Paul had a pretty good layout of what a pandemic would look like in some aspects long before this happened. So there's, there's talk about, I don't remember if I actually asked you this flat out during the last episode. When was, do you remember having ever heard of personal protective equipment as a statement prior to say, I don't know, February of 2020? Uh, no, uh, uh, not that I remember anyway, if it was, if it was something that I heard, I, it didn't register. Sure. So we all now know PPE and we know personal protective equipment, right? But Paul had this in his book, I, I'm assuming a, a year ago, probably maybe even longer ago than that when he was working on it. Um, there's, you know, there's at one point a couple of nurses discussing the fact that they're not properly trained for this, you know, that they got a, a, a short little seminar on what to do, but that they're not properly trained. They don't have enough equipment. Hospitals are overrun and all these things will likely sound familiar to people listening to this episode. So it, it's really interesting to see how he was able to capture that stuff without having um, COVID-19 as a, as a template for, for what that might look like. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, 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 uh, I'm sure that the experience that we've gone through over the last four months has informed our absorption of the information differently. Like, uh, like you had said uh, uh, previously. So, uh, Story-wise, uh, the prelude really catalyzes everything that's going to happen over the course of the book. In the prelude, we're introduced to Natalie Nats. We'll probably just start calling her Nats, um, who is, um, she seems like she's overly 
paranoid about uh, what's going on outside. So the, as the synopsis says, right now it's Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts that's experiencing this. So this isn't like a global pandemic like we're going through now. And it seems like it's gotten far enough where, um, like Livia said, the government is controlling like distribution of food and stuff, but people still, it's not like the regimented um, plans that the government has that we're going through now. It seems like it's just more like, oh, I heard it's bad, but we haven't seen it first person. Anyway, uh, so Nats is at home. Paul is out trying to pick up the groceries. Nats is eight months pregnant and she's... <laughs> hanging out in the house with no lights on, trying not to make any noise because she doesn't want to attract attention because she's worried that something's going to come and attack her uh, or her and Paul uh, when he gets back. He comes back, and uh, not long after he gets back, dude just wanders up their front porch and starts, like, knocking on the door and trying to get in and, and sounding a little bit crazy. And not long after that, he gets in and, and pretty much chaos ensues. Right. So as the synopsis says, Paul, not to be confused with Paul Tremblay, but Paul, um, <laughs> Adley's husband, um, is killed <clears throat> and she is bitten. And that's where the prologue leaves us now. So the very first chapter of the book introduces us to Dr. Um, Ramola Sherman Rams, as mentioned before. And basically, that's where we get some other information about the pandemic. And that's where we find out about shortages of protective equipment and lack of training as she's uh, preparing to, to go into work um, for her first shift as a uh, doctor who is uh, going to be dealing with uh, infected people. She gets a freaked out call from her college friend and, and best friend, Natalie. Um, that, you know, states what has happened, that her husband was killed, that she's been bitten and she needs to get to a hospital. So they uh, they agree to meet at Ram's place and head to the hospital where she works, which incidentally is a hospital where people are being routed that have this rabies infection. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say now that there's probably not much more into the plot that we're going to be going Um just because this is one of those ones that it, it reads very fast. Uh, and like we said before, it doesn't take place over a huge amount of time. We don't want to spoil too much of it for you. But um, yeah, so uh, the once they leave Ram's house and they head out toward the hospital to um, to try and, you know, help Nats before uh, she potentially gets infected that starts off kind of the momentum of of the way the story is going to go for for the duration of the book so um they have a goal which is get to the hospital get nat's help and um as they go we see all of the crazy impacts that are happening because of this the spread of this infection uh approaching the hospital uh the the police and, and military are managing crowds and streets and telling people where to go and um but still by the time they get to the hospital it's 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 what you would expect of just like flooded with people who think that you know regardless if they are or not think they might be infected and are trying to get help and um you know a situation that's obviously just destined to to get out of control yeah our protagonists, uh, as you can well imagine, are presented with a series of obstacles along the way through the course of this uh, of this temporarily short book. Um, there's not a lot of characters to really talk about. Um, I know we're going to zero in on a couple. So um, we've covered Natalie and Rams. Um, you know, there are other physicians, nurses and stuff. They don't necessarily play a critical role in the book. But uh, at one point, the, the two of them do cross paths with some slightly familiar fellas. Yeah. And um, th this was one of those things. I I'm sure that in the multiple interviews we've done with Paul in the past, we've talked about um, doing stories that uh, include information from other stories and stuff. But there are two characters where if you've read other books of, of Paul's, you'll recognize there's two kids. One's name's Lewis and the other's name is Josh. And they're um, essentially, in, they they come into contact with Nats and Rams while they're uh, 
Nats and Rams are trying to get to one of the places they're trying to get to throughout the book. They're driving and they see these kids kind of like hiding off in the bushes off to the side of the road. And they're like, oh, what's going on with these creepy kids? And then, you know, uh, some events happen to, to have them, uh, uh, you know, kind of join join forces. Yeah, and that's likely all we'll say on that, too. This uh, I guess I didn't think about the fact that, you know, I said we've said a couple of times now how this doesn't take place over a long period of time. And it almost feels like even though it's, you know, whatever the average length book that we do here, it feels like we can't go in as deep yeah. because so maybe when a book only takes place over the course of, you know, say 24 hours, like you just can't go in as far into the story, which is kind of an interesting thing that I guess I've never thought about. Um, right. I will say this, um, you know, this, this story you know, kind of works itself into your mind on two levels. There is a pressing sense of urgency um, because we have a main character who is pregnant um, and potentially infected with this virus. So uh, clearly the goal is to get her and her baby safe and secure. So there's that anxiety and pressure around that. Um, through that, you get some action-y stuff, right? There are going to be obstacles and they're going to have to overcome them. But really, there's this relationship between these two women who are college friends, um, you know, who are now in their mid 30s. And, you know, one of them as a doctor who has a basic understanding of, of uh, you know, the health needs of a person and, and another woman that's completely freaked out because she just watched her husband die. You know, when we start this story less than an hour ago. Um, and she's, you know, now worried about the the fate of her child, her unborn child. So, I mean, there's really kind of, you know, two different directions that that this um, that this story kind of works its way into you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And there's a couple of things that I'd like to kind of just talk a little bit about that I think are very effective in the book. Part of it is the um, the tension of trying to get to the thing that you need with all of these obstacles and in this crazy situation with like, it's got a ticking clock kind of feel to it because she might be infected and needs to get treated as soon as possible. So there's that like anxiety and tension built into it, um, which uh, especially with the short time frame that we've talked about, I think is massively effective because um, I, I wouldn't call it a page turner, but I would definitely say that you feel um, that ticking clock. You feel like as you're reading through everything that happens, you're like, please just get her there. So you really definitely identify with that part of it. The other thing that I would like to acknowledge is that the violence is goddamn violent. <laughs> like <laughs> from the very beginning in the prelude, when um, Paul is killed, it's not like, oh, Paul's killed. It's like, very graphic and violent and and uh it, it shocking because it's the very first thing you're reading in this book is is this crazy crazy violent encounter between this married couple and this total stranger who's infected with this like freaky disease that everybody's terrified about for sure and i, I guess the one thing that i would point out and i know i, I mentioned it briefly before but, but we're dropped in mid-story um which allows for for that for that scene to happen on page one or yep. whatever, page five, right by the time it happens, um, versus the slow buildup um, that you typically see in a book that that covers some type of, you know, a zombie apocalypse, right, or some other type of disaster or maybe other pandemic books where it's chapters and chapters of slow rolling information coming in, um, telling you what's happening and having people, you know, go through the you know, the, the stages of, you know, denial and, and worry and whatever. No, we know this is happening. Um, and, and our, our protagonist, our main protagonist is introduced to it head on, like on the third or fourth page of the book. Um, so that definitely keeps, it starts off at a high pace and then, you know, man, just to maintain that pace by and large throughout the course of the book. Yep. Now, the other thing I think I'd like to acknowledge just a little bit is, um, uh, and I said this on social media the other day uh, is that like, I have a tendency to like emotionally connect really well with the stories that we've read by Paul and, and this one, I think more so than other ones. So I said something on social media to the effect of, 
you know that you know I cry in Paul's books all the time, and I think he wrote this one just to see how much how many tears he could collect from me. Um, and to 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 illustrate that, um, there are so uh, Nats, the character, the pregnant, eight months pregnant, potentially infected character. Uh, one of the things she does throughout the book is she's got an app on her phone. I think it's called uh, Voyager, um, and it's basically like an audio. It's like a it's like a an app diary for a, a parent to their unborn child, and so when it kind of sinks into her that a Paul's gone, and b she might be infected and and might you know she's anticipating the worst. She starts this like you know diary to her unborn child post potential infection and so she's basically talking to a kid that she has no expectation of ever meeting and so 30 percent into the book i'm rolling tears because that's the first time she does this um this app entry thing where she's talking to her baby even though she thinks hey i'm gonna be dead before ever getting to, to meet this child. So it was just, so the emotional um, gravity of that situation happens throughout the book, I think at a perfect pace, because there's a lot that you have to take in with what's happening in the moment, what um, what's happening in the minds of the characters, but also like um, this emotional thing. And I think that he does that uh, exceptionally well in this book. Yeah, those parts are very touching. Um, the app was a nice touch. I, I think to, like, I don't. I'm trying to think. Um, like it, you've seen it in movies and TV shows, right? Where the person finds like the videotape from their like deceased loved one or whatever. I, I don't know that I've ever seen it um, used, like in the moment. If that makes sense. So we're seeing her recording this in the event that something happens to her. Typically. I think we see these these are that that's how a movie ends right or a TV show right um, there's a climax at some point and then afterwards they find this piece that was left behind by the the person they care about with you know messages saying if you're seeing this I'm no longer yeah. around kind of <laughs> kind of thing so so I don't know if I've seen it used like in the present um, so much as kind of like after the fact so but yeah very very that's nice a, touch that's a good point yeah it's always the like the thing that's the emotional like kind of like anchor at the end as opposed to like watching a character verbally process the fact that mm-hmm. they're going through this horrible situation then think about that that's a really good insight yeah and then the other the other you know kind of touching part uh, of this book i think it's just the relationship between the two of them um yeah. you know again one potentially very sick and in, in, in a in a desperate situation right because she's concerned about the the loss of her baby and, and just the interaction between the two of them and not necessarily that it's in a sappy way you know it it, it feels kind of genuine because there's a lot of annoyance between the two of them like you can have with a close friend and it doesn't mean you love them any less right but they're also the people that can irk you the most sometimes Yep. In a high pressure situation, I, I think that those characters are, are, are really well written. Yeah. And honestly, like, here's the thing. We are absolutely about to do spoiler talk. I can feel it. Like the conversation takes a different pace just before spoiler talk because we're like trying to wrap up any final thoughts. Um, and absolutely, we're going to talk about Josh and Lewis and the significance of those characters uh, to this book over in spoiler talk. And honestly, like. There are there's a few topics specifically that um, that we're going to go into that if you're feeling like, hey, man, I re- they're really holding back on X, Y, Z. We won't be holding back on those things over in Spoiler Talk. Spoiler Talk is available at Patreon.com <laughs> slash book podcasts for subscribers at a two dollar a month or more level. And Rob and I occasionally uh, head over there to talk about things we can't talk about here two reasons one we don't want to spoil it for you um hopefully you're listening to this and then you're going to go out and buy this book and read it um second it's a way for us to try to get two bucks out of you every single month so if i'm being honest it it is twofold right because if not (laughs) we would just have spoiler talk it would be just me and you talking and it wouldn't be like available for anyone listening so anyway we're gonna go do that and we'll be back in a matter of seconds
we are back from uh we did a little spoiler talk over on our patreon and um even though we had already done this spoiler talk it was nice to kind of go over the things that we can't talk about over here uh before we go into you know our wrap-ups and stuff like that for sure but first we want to take a moment to thank um a few of our newest patreons i'm not going to do last names here but kimberly make them i hope i'm saying that right and dk um, three of our most recent uh, Patreon supporters, so um, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, it's cool. I, uh, you know, it's nice when you see we get. I get these little emails that say, "Hey, there's a new, there's someone new uh, who actually knows your podcast," and it's like, "Oh, the outside world acknowledges what we do." That's uh, that's good to know. Fives of people listen to this podcast, <laughs> Rob. Don't forget, fives of people. So. <laughs> Um, I am going to um, I'm going to go right to the wrap up, if that's OK with you. Hit it. All right. So I'm going to briefly explain the scoring system. I feel like we haven't done that in a couple of uh, a couple of book reviews. So um, we have eight, eight categories that we rate from one to ten. And then we aggregate a score for each of us. And then we combine those two scores and split it down the middle and we get a final score. So um, we rate books on their conclusion the characters, the language used, the narrative, the pace, the plot, the tone, and our personal score. Sometimes, you know, uh, maybe all those other things can all be great, but it just didn't do it for you. Or vice versa. Maybe it's written awfully, but you still love the story, right? So there's a personal score in there, but it counts as, you know, whatever that is, 12, 13 percent, whatever the math works out to, right? So, um, conclusion. Uh, I... <laughs> I'm not usually a big fan of ambiguous endings, but sometimes like I get it and it's good. This was a not an ambiguous ending. I really like this ending. I like the way he wrapped up um, multiple threads throughout this story. So I'm going to say just the ending of the book, but there's some wrap up that happens on some other things too, that I, I really, really appreciated. And the pace. I do like a long book that takes place over a short period of time. I think that's where an author can really show their, uh, their writing chops um, I've read books that that covered literal generations of people in in maybe not the 320 pages or whatever this lends itself to. But I, I could think of a couple where in four or five hundred pages, I, I've seen the lives of uh, today's protagonists, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. Right. So instead, we shrink something down to less than a day um, and, and uh, I'm not going to say how long it takes because I feel like that's a little spoilery. But again, from a time standpoint, it's a very short book, and that lends itself to a pretty breakneck pace, um, which I really liked. Um, the other uh, highest marks I gave it were for um, narrative and, and my per personal score. So after I average all of that out, it comes out to an 8.88 .88 out of 10. Great job, Mr. Trumbly. Uh, great job indeed. And before I go into my wrap up, uh, during the course of this uh, this recording, we have gone from I, I think I got the rain that Livius mentioned earlier that he was uh, running through drops. I don't know if that was in the spoiler talk or in the regular review, but it's raining basically is what I'm trying to say. So if you hear like little tink, tink, tink behind me, that's uh, that's rain hitting the, the building. So apologies for that. <sighs> yeah, I guess I have some thoughts about uh, this book. Um, go, I'm going to say right up front, I gave it nine and a half out of ten. I thought it was a spectacular book and I um, have already probably categorized it as my favorite novel of Paul's that I have read. Um, I just thought it was tremendous. Uh, I agree basically with everything Livia said. The conclusion was fantastic for all of the reasons he said. Um, it just, it just knocked me out. I, I loved it so much. Um, I feel like characters deserves a little bit of acknowledgement because he did an incredible job of developing characters in such a compressed timeline. Um, and, and the way that he, he treated some characters that we've known, uh, outside of this book as well was, was, was pretty impressive. So the fact that we're, that we're experiencing a very short amount of these people's lives, we still got such a, a depth and breadth of, of understanding who they are as people and and even kind of growing with them a little bit, um, I, I was just very impressed. I thought I thought he did a wonderful job of that. Um, I didn't score anything particularly low, <laughs> so I just think everything worked very well. Um, he he did a great job of creating um, 
a combination of momentum and frustration, I think, uh, is the is the way that I've been thinking about it, because from the moment Nats leaves to go meet up with Rams, you're constantly moving. There's constantly a goal that we have to achieve, but along the way, such frustrating obstacles to overcome, uh, and that was just very well done. So uh, <sighs> everything about this book, I loved. I think it was great, and. Um, it, Again, he took what is potentially your boilerplate contagion type situation and used that as um, like very effective set dressing for a very personal story about uh, this woman and the hardships she has to go through, or these women, I guess, and the hardships they have to go through in, in this chaotic situation. Um, highly recommended. I love all of Paul's books, and I think that I would I would tell people to read all of them, but especially for people who are just introducing themselves to to him and his his style of writing, it, this is just this is wonderful. So, like I said before, nine and a half stars, averaged out with Livius. Booked is giving this this book nine point one eight seven five out of ten. Um, if that sounds like really far off from ten, just to know that we're solid halfway through the year and this is our highest rated book yeah that's an excellent score like i would say that like getting an eight is is good like is is a good score so getting over a nine come on i love this system because it's i don't want to say it's impossible it's very unlikely that we'll see a 10 at least average between the two of us right like you just have to <laughs> yeah. you have to excel at everything and and here like the peek behind the curtain. So I, every rating I have is eight nines and tens, and all of yours are nines and tens, right? Yep. So um, it, it would have to blow you away on so many levels, and then it would have to affect both of us the same way. Right. So it's weird <laughs> because I think longtime listeners like man, I used to score a lot of five star books. When you just generically are throwing, there's no like science behind how you're rating. Yeah. Then you go, ah, four stars, five stars, 12 stars, whatever, right? But yeah, this this system um, works better. I don't know that anybody is running around touting their 9.18 score. Like they might say, <laughs> hey, this this podcast gave my book five stars, right? So one, one sounds better than the other, but I, I'm far more comfortable um, with this system than, than than I was with the other one. Yeah, it feels more honest. And, and, well, obvi- and honestly, like... There's going to be some amazing books that just don't need to score high in all of these categories to be a great book. So you might have a book that's um, like the plot is so intense and amazing that, you know, the, you know, the pace doesn't even matter because it's like a super slow, big, long book or something like that. So, like, even if something scores lower in a specific category, it might just mean that book didn't need that thing in order to be amazing. So, yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you a perfect example because I know we're segueing into something else here. But um, <laughs> I just listened to the audiobook of uh, The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon. And on pace, I'd probably struggle to give that book a seven. Right. And yet it's one of my favorite books of all time. Exactly. Like uh, that's and that's that's a little bit more relevatory, too, because it doesn't you don't just think about like, is this a good book or a bad book? You think about what makes this a good book. So it actually kind of like, it pushes you to think more critically about the qualities of the book more granularly than you would if it was just like, Oh, it's you know, five stars. So it makes us better people, I guess is what we're trying to say. Right. It makes us, it gives us the ability to tell people that it makes us better people. That's even more important. It's good enough for me, man. I mean, gesture that we're better people. Yeah, so listen, two weeks ago, Carlos Ruiz Zafan passed away um, unexpectedly for us. Um, I don't believe either one of us were um, aware that he was suffering from a colorectal cancer. Um, Age 55 and an absolutely stunningly brilliant writer. And uh, look, writers pass away, you know all the time right i mean people have been writing writing's not a new thing um you know so it's it's it, nearly a week goes by that you don't see a post on some 
some author that died, but very, very, very few have hit me like like this one hit me. I was genuinely bummed out um, when this happened two weeks ago. Yeah, and it's interesting because like I'm not I'm uh, I, what I'm going what I'm about to say is is me getting at the fact that like even though you're newer to the author, he had that big of an impact on you because you didn't start reading books of his until a couple of years in the last couple of years. Still, you are so impacted by this. Um, it, my story of of being introduced to him is: I have an uncle who collects um, rare books in the coolest way ever. He goes to garage sales, he goes to thrift stores, and he finds like a box of books for five bucks. Um, but he knows what to look for, so he knows what's the right edition. Even down to this is crazy. Like he'll be. He'll be buying a box of books and he'll see like a second or third printing of a book. Um, so it's not like the the most rare best edition, but if the book jacket is really crisp and clean and nice and it's better than the book jacket he's got on his first edition, bam, that's why he wants the book. Like that's how far he goes into it. So anyway, I'm visiting him one time, probably about 12, 13 years ago. And um, we're just talking about books and we're looking at his incredible collection and he hands me shadow of the wind a first edition you know u.s uh, uh version of the book and and not even like a, hey man i read this and it's going to change your world it was just like hey i know how important this book is you should have a copy of it and then within a couple of years literally like a month probably before we started doing this podcast um i read it and i loved it and um yeah i've been pushing livius to read it ever since <laughs> Yeah, and Rob's right. Probably getting close to two years ago, I uh, I, I read it, and you know, say like, you know, book changed my life, and you hear dumb things like that. But I got to tell you, I look at literary fiction um, a little differently, I think, than I did after reading that book. So um, I've highly recommended on this podcast, you know, umpteen times over the last two years. Uh, I'm gonna kind of go through it again. I think that this is a book that was written for people who love books. Um, at its center is a mystery. Um, that mystery involves an author and, uh, and a book to some extent, just this beautifully written story with tons of, of interesting characters, um, plot twists, um, the romance. I mean, you name it. it, it's all in here and it's excellent. Absolutely. Excellent. It's the first book in a series that are loosely connected stories around a place called the cemetery of forgotten books. And that's the, the name of the series. So I have read the first two. Um, I was thinking over the course of the next two years, I wanted to read the, the, the other two. And now um, it's going to sound inauthentic because we already talked about this, but Rob knows there are a couple of Richard Lehman books. I haven't read because I realized that at some point I would run out of Richard Lehman books to look forward to. Uh, the same thing is happening with uh, with Senor Zafon, and uh, I will likely um, not be getting to those two books anywhere in near the the, the two year kind of goal that I had set to um, read. I just wanted to space them apart nicely. I didn't want to burn through them and be done with them. But now that I know that there will be no more new books from him, my pace will slow forever. And then the frightening thing is, I was thinking about this after we talked about it the other night. So something terrible happens to me and I've never finished the cemetery of forgotten books or all the Richard Lehman books. So I'm, I'm really walking, I'm walking a fine line here between being eternally disappointed. You're playing with fire, buddy. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it is what it is, but yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, you know me, there's not a lot of things I take super, super seriously, but I mean, there's a special place in my heart for, for Richard Lehman and, and definitely one for Carlos Ruiz Safan. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. Uh, and just a little context for, for listeners as far as like, uh, you know, we, we've exalted the shadow of the wind. Um, if anybody has read or listened to our, um, read the book, sorry, let's see by Aaron Morgenstern or listened to our review about it. Um, Livius famously calls it a love letter to storytelling, which I absolutely agree with. Um, so if you're into that type of thing, if you read Sarah, let's see, and you want something that's a little bit, probably a little bit more dense and a little bit heavier, but just like magnificently written. I would say that that's a book that you would uh, be interested in. The other parallel I want to make is I feel like 
introducing you to to Carlos Ruiz Zafon was was like returning the favor for you introducing me to Arturo Perez Riverte. Um, yeah. Because you you made me read uh, Club Dumas, and then from there I went on to read, and, and I was like, man, this man is just a, a magnificent writer. He does historical fiction so well, um, and mysteries and intrigue and, and working in the present day and stuff. And I was really, really in love with this dude. Um, and also an author from Spain. And then I read Carlos Ruiz Zafon and I was like, okay, all right. I like this too in a different way. Um, but like, obviously I prefer him. It might be the stories. It might be this, the, like the, the quality of the writing, better than Arturo Perez Reverte. But uh, what I'm getting at is if you like Arturo Perez Reverte, this would be a very easy transition into similar stuff, but more of like a literary thing as opposed to like war and, and intrigue and stuff. For sure. And, and just so you know, I, I spent some time on different forums or, or whatever, like if you like the shadow of the wind, you know, kind of right. pages, and um, yeah, Reverte comes up a significant amount yeah. of the time. And and I don't think it's just because they're both Spanish. I think the Club Dumas in some ways shares some similarities to the shadow of the wind. Sure. And when I say that, not not the ninth gate, the, 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 <laughs> the Club the Dumas. The actual Club, right? Club Dumas book, yeah. Well, that 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 like intrigue and mysterious characters and, and it all kind of revolves around a, a book as well. You know what I mean? Right. So I, I think there's there's some some good reasons for those comparisons. And, yeah, I mean, you know, the the Club Dumas is a spectacular book. I read several others. There was um, um, the Fencing Master, right? Was Fencing that... Master was very good. Yep. Seville yeah. Communion, I think. Seville mm -hmm. Communion. That and then he good. got in. He started doing those Captain Alatriste novels, <laughs> and I read the first one, and it it just didn't it just didn't do it for me. Right. So, oh, yeah. So yeah. I, well, I did yeah. Not his, read the sequels. His early books, like there's like his first four or five that we just we just named rock solid, fantastic, especially Fencing Master, which I think was his first book. Um, masterfully done, masterfully. Ha ha. You get it. <laughs> got it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to give you the, the, the template for what's uh, what's coming up the rest of this month. We will likely have some interviews with people whose books we will be reviewing or have very, very, very recently reviewed. We're still working on that. But um, next week, Wonderland by Zoya Stage. The following week, Mallory by Josh Mallerman. And the week after that, so three weeks from now, The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. This is probably the biggest... Um, month of books that we've had maybe <laughs> potentially in 10 years, right? Like where we've yeah. had a jam packed with, um, we don't know how good they are. Right. But you talk about rock star writers, um, just one after the other. So very, very busy month for booked. We expect to have, you know, who knows, two to four interviews sprinkled in there as well. So lots of good content coming up for you. Yeah. And before we sign off, I just want to acknowledge how hard it has been getting through 2020 to get to this point because we've had Mallory a long ass time. We had survivor song for months. We had wonderland since like Christmas only good Indians arrived months ago and we don't read them until we review them. So like these, like we're, you know, we're reading all these other things and I'm thinking, why can't I just pick up Mallory? So this is a big payoff uh, for, for months and months of um, good behavior, I guess. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And like I said, some of uh, the biggest anticipated books for me personally coming up this month. So I've already started Wonderland. Just FYI. Got through two lives mm. lunches with some Wonderland. About 50-ish pages in. So uh, I'm excited. I was really excited to crack that one. Out. But I've been saying it for a long time. That's uh, We did do the Starless Sea this year, right? That was early in the year. Or was that no, last that was, year? That was 19, 2019. Okay. So yeah, Wonderland is the book I've most been looking forward to this year so finally get finally getting on to it so really excited all right i think that's going to wrap it up for um uh, a review of of the beginning of like super book month um join us again next week obviously for either an interview or wonderland or both and uh yeah till then i'm rob olson and i'm livia snedden keep reading <laughs>